On February 28, 1983, two men made a grisly discovery in a vacant apartment building in St. Louis, Missouri. The headless body of a black child wearing nothing but a yellow sweater. The case sits unsolved over 30 years later and little Jane Doe's head has never been found, nor has her identity been revealed. Most of the scant evidence in the case has been lost, but how? In this episode of It's a Mystery, we'll discuss the case of Jane Doe, sometimes referred referred to as Hope. By the late 70s, St. Louis was an aging part of the Rust Belt, a formerly industrious area of the country that was ravaged by deindustrialization and urban decay. From 1950 to 1970, approximately 60% of white citizens left the city for suburbs, and during the 70s, many left the area altogether. That decade, the city decreased from roughly 622,000 to 452,000, with 60,000 of the people leaving being black. However, the city would ultimately stay majority black in the decades to come. In the early 80s, politicians focused on redevelopment and made budget cuts, a major and harmful cut being the closure of the Homer G. Phillips Hospital, which had been servicing the black community since the 1930s. In the time of Jane Doe's death, St. Louis was experiencing high crime rates like many urban decay cities. The location where her body was found was near the Cabin Courts Projects, which had been built in 1973 and by the 80s was known for several murders. After the mismanaged and neglected pruitt Igo low-income housing projects were destroyed beginning in 1972, many residents moved to the West End, site of the Cabane projects and slumlord-owned buildings that often fell into disrepair and went vacant. Unsurprisingly, the same problems of racial and wealth inequality persisted. Be sure to check out the pruitt Igo myth documentary, which is an excellent history lesson. As for our mystery, in February 1983, two men entered a vacant apartment building at 5635 Clemens Avenue, where they claimed to be looking for scrap metal. When lighting a cigarette in the basement, they found the decapitated body of Jane Doe. They called the police. Along with patrolmen, homicide detectives Joe Bargoon and Herb Riley arrived to the scene and immediately assumed that the girl was probably a sex worker or drug addict from the nearby Cabane courts. Jane Doe was naked from the waist down except for a loose-fitting yellow v-neck sweater flecked with blood. At the base where her neck should have been, there was a hole sprouting mold, indicating that she had been in the basement for a while. Her fingers had chipped red nail polish, clearly visible because her hands were bound behind her back with a piece of red and white nylon rope. When her body was finally flipped over, it became clear that she was a prepubescent girl between the ages of 8 and 11. An autopsy found she had been sexually assaulted and possibly strangled. One report claimed she was big for her age, as her height without head and neck was a bit over four feet. Evidence indicated that she was killed elsewhere and brought to the basement while still bleeding because of blood trails. Police searched a 16-block area around the building for the head and turned up nothing. They also sent out a 50-state bulletin and heard back nothing. Police waited for someone to claim the girl and nobody did. After a week, she officially became Jane Doe. Detective Herb Riley would send bulletins about Jane Doe to police departments in all 50 states every February 28th for about 12 years and never got a reply. In December 1983, she was finally laid to rest in Washington Park Cemetery, a historic black graveyard in North St. Louis, during a funeral attended by a handful of, quote, homicide detectives, the chief medical examiner, and a half dozen news reporters. Captain Leroy Adkins was the first black head of homicide in St. Louis, and he claimed that he wanted to dispel the belief among many of the city's black residents that the police department cared more about white victims than black ones. He also expressed his dismay at black residents not cooperating with police. At a 1983 community meeting, he said, somebody out there knows something. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends. Somewhere out there is a mother without a little girl, a brother without a sister, a neighbor without a little girl running up and down the street. 
The homicide investigators tried in vain to search for Jane Doe's identity. Initially, they went around the schools in the area looking for girls who were missing. It didn't help matters that school records were rarely accurate, though they did manage to comb through St. Louis City schools and ones in four other nearby districts. Nobody matching Jane Doe's description was ever found missing by the detectives or reported missing. There have been numerous false leads and attempts to uncover Jane Doe's identity over the years since. For instance, the same year Jane Doe was found, a woman appeared at a police station claiming she met the killer, saying he lived a few blocks from the dump site. She went on to say the man invited her into his apartment and showed off a human skull and a machete. The lead detectives on Jane Doe's case gathered and executed a search warrant for the man, finding a cheap machete unable to slice through a human neck and a skull actually procured from a science classroom. In the late 80s, Detective Burgoon became so desperate for a lead that he sat in on a seance where photocopies of Jane Doe's fingerprints were passed around to psychics. Burgoon recalled, at the end of the meeting, they told me to call the Coast Guard. The head is on a boat in the Gulf of Mexico. This was a dead end. I've only found one suspect who was ever remotely linked to the murder of Jane Doe in the 80s, so let's turn our attention to Vernon Brown. In the late 70s, he was convicted of molesting a 12-year-old girl for which he did four years in an Indiana prison. He was also suspected of raping and strangling nine-year-old Kimberly Campbell, whose body was found in a vacant residence owned by Vernon's grandmother. In 1985, he had relocated to St. Louis under an assumed name and settled down with a wife and three stepsons. On October 24, 1986, after picking up his stepsons, ages 7, 9, and 11, he lured 9-year-old Janet Perkins into his house while she was walking home. His stepsons and a neighbor witnessed this, and so Vernon locked his stepsons into their rooms from the outside, took Janet into the basement, tied her up, assaulted her, and strangled her. The stepsons heard the cries of the nine-year-old from inside their rooms and would later testify in court against Brown. Janet's body was found a day later in two trash bags behind a dumpster in an alley behind Brown's house, and he was quickly arrested. He confessed to the crime and to the murder of 19-year-old Sinetta Ford a year before. Brown never confessed to the murder of Jane Doe, but police thought he may have been involved in the beheading or possibly 20 other crimes. He was executed on May 18, 2005. All this time, Vernon Brown was the only loosely considered suspect in the murder of Jane Doe, or the one that was reported in the media. The thing is, finding the murderer in any case usually requires identifying the victim, something cops still hadn't managed to do. In 1994, John Burgoon and Leroy Atkins appeared on the National syndicated show Sightings for another seance to determine Jane Doe's identity and to bring publicity to the case. Not only was this move not fruitful, it irreversibly damaged the investigation. The detectives had foolishly mailed the yellow sweater and the rope to the show's production so the psychic could get an accurate reading. They never got the evidence back because it was lost in the mail. Another unfortunate aspect of the St. Louis Jane Doe case is how her body was handled once buried. In 1991, the Washington Park Cemetery's owner, Virginia Younger, committed suicide after facing a lawsuit by the state attorney general over mishandled burials, including multiple burials in the same plots and bodies missing from graves. For years, the historically black cemetery was woefully overgrown with shrubbery and neglected. Jane Doe's grave would have been impossible to find if Detective Burgoon hadn't videotaped the location in the 90s. Thankfully, her corpse was relocated to Calvary Cemetery by the nonprofit's group Garden of Innocence, who provide burials for unclaimed children and infants. There are multiple reasons why Jane Doe's case seems unlikely to ever be solved. The victim seems to have never officially existed and was never officially identified, making a motive impossible to figure out. Investigators theorized that Jane's killing was done by a parent or close relative who may already be serving a prison term. A part of me wonders if the girl was born in a brothel or in sex trafficking conditions where a birth would not be reported and no schooling would be expected. The red nail polish on her fingers usually looked down on when worn by girls in the black community as a sign of fastness was an even more common notion in the past. If she did grow up in a brothel or similar, red nail polish would not be forbidden. 
A 2013 report based on Jane Doe's DNA said she grew up in the southeast, which is a very general and broad conclusion. Lastly, the disappearance of the scant evidence in the case, a yellow bloody sweater without labels and the red and white rope, seems to be the final thing that is holding back this case from progressing. One source of hope is that Jane Doe's DNA is in the FBI's CODIS, which might eventually match her to DNA material found at another crime scene. Until that happens, if it ever does, the case of the beheaded Jane Doe remains a mystery. Wanna see more great long format videos like this? Well, you can, over on Patreon, where a one to three dollar monthly pledge grants you access to exclusive videos and essays. Plus, your pledge produces more great free content like this. Check the link in the description box below for more information. Also, be sure to like this video and subscribe.